Amen. Hey, join me in verse 12 of Mark 6. This is where we ended last week. You'll remember Jesus has traveled home to Nazareth, his hometown. Woohoo! And when he went home to his hometown, he was rejected. Boo! They said, Isn't this the carpenter? Slam. Isn't this Mary's son? Slam. Aren't his brothers, James and Joseph, and all, you know, all these guys? Slam. And his sisters, they're all, what the heck? Where did he get this wisdom and power? And how is he doing these things? They're on the right trail, but then it says they were offended at him. We're not going to listen to this guy. We're not going to take what he has to say. We know where he came from. And Jesus was rejected in his hometown. He handled this rejection so well. A prophet is not without honor, except at home, except with the people that know him so well. Careful of that. And it's fun to, or it's easy to pick on them. Like, wow, what a bunch of dummies. You know, I can't believe they did that. But the reality is, familiarity can breed contempt even in us. We can take Jesus, the word, worship, gathering together for granted. Eh, you know, I'm, yeah, we're going to study God's word, but you know, I, I didn't read it this morning. I'm, I'm not, we, you know, what am I really supposed, is it really that important? And they saw Jesus in this way, they totally missed it. I could judge them if I wanted to, but I've totally missed it. I've totally blown. I want to learn from these guys. Can you imagine like how silly Jesus is right there? Like, boo, we don't want any of this. Like, whoa, I've done that before. Well, Jesus then, in light of that, assembled his boys. All right, guys, two by two, you're going to go out and you're going to take with you nothing, just a staff and some shoes, put your jacket on. You don't need two jackets, no food, no money. Just trust the process. Woo! By the way, this isn't a mandate for ministry. Later on in Jesus' ministry, in the latter part of Luke, he'll instruct his disciples, now when you go out, take some stuff. Get some money, get a backpack. Get, if you don't have a knife, go buy one. This was a mandate, trusting the process in this season for their faith. It's kind of interesting how God will do that for your life and my life. I just sense the Lord wants me to do it this way right now. I, I sense he wants me to trust him for this process. And then maybe down the road, a year or 10 later, you're gonna do it differently. This requires sensitivity to the Lord, doesn't it? A relationship with him. I think you guys all get that. We know that. And Jesus leads his boys in this way. And here's my point. He's equipping them now. I asked this question last week. How many of you guys would vote? Hey, Jesus, you keep driving the bus and you keep doing all the talking. Like, this is fun. And Jesus, on the heels of being rejected and seeing what's going on. By the way, this chapter in Mark 6 is about two and a half years into Jesus's ministry. He's already halfway done. Mark goes at a very fast pace, jumps a lot of things. What we're gonna see today is a horrible story. Right in light of Jesus sending his boys out and his fame growing, we're gonna see all the gospel writers minus John include this story, and this story is the story of John the baptizer being murdered, John the baptizer being beheaded during this time. Sometimes when I'm studying the Gospels and reading, especially at the early parts and seeing what Jesus is doing, he's combating devils and Pharisees and people, but it's not really that bad. And then you realize we're marching towards death. We're marching, we're in a very, we're in a war. This is crazy town. And sometimes I get forgetful of that. Oh, wow. Real bloodshed, real loss. Before we get there, though, two more verses in this last portion. Jesus tells his boys to go out. Look at verse 12. It says, so they went out and preached that people should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. I love this because this would have been crazy. Jesus pulls the boys aside right after he's been rejected. And he's like, I'm going to send you guys out now, too. They're like, they just rejected you, bro. <laughs> like, how's it going to go for us? Like, yeah, it might be rough. It might be rough. What are we going to tell people? Oh, tell them to repent. They love that message. <laughs> huh? What? And what do they do? They do it. I love verse 12. And they went. I got it circled. It's like so simple. But so many times we hear God's word, we agree with it. We say, well, we should totally do that. No, we should totally do that. You should, you should totally do that. <laughs> These guys totally did it. On Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, we gathered as a group in Corvallis, and I taught on Tuesday at 3.30, and the Lord had put on my heart a message titled, Confirming Your Calling and Commission. It's kind of a mouthful. I shouldn't have titled it that, but I did anyways. And the confirming of your calling and commission came from this idea that sometimes we need to be kicked in the butt and reminded what in the heck we're actually doing. I'm talking to ministry people, and we're all in the ministry, and there's all kinds of different angles. 
It was kind of a kick in the butt message that the Lord gave to me, but I should have called it this. I should have called it fulfill your ministry. As I was studying, I was led to first Timothy, nope, second Timothy, I'll read it to you. It's gonna be on the screens. This is what Paul said to Timothy, young Timotheus, in verse one of chapter four. He said, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. And they will turn their ears aside from the truth and the, be turned aside to fables. Verse five, final thought. But you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, and fulfill your ministry. Stop right there, eyes up here. Paul would have his head cut off into a basket shortly after this letter. It's his final letter, 2 Timothy. And he looks at young Tim. He says, preach the word in and out of season, endure afflictions, do the work of evangelism. And finally, last thought, fulfill your ministry. I just wanna let that hang for a second. What's your ministry? If you're a man, if you're a woman, if you're single, if you're married, if you've got kids or grandkids, if you've got neighbors, if you've got giftings you're aware of, the answer to that question should come quickly. Your ministry. My ministry's to my spouse. My ministry's to my kids. My ministry's to my community. I own a small business. My ministry is to my staff, my, my employees. My, my ministry is to something. And, and it should come quickly. I'm not saying you're doing it well. I would never boast about the way I do my ministry. Man, I'm trying to figure it out every single day. And that's why Paul, I believe, says this to the young Timothy. Hey, fulfill your ministry. And this is why it impresses me that in verse 12 of Mark chapter six, it says, so they went and they did it. So excited that they actually got off their blessed assurance and went out and did something because the tendency is for us to kind of pull back. Notice also the setup here. He says, go out and preach repentance. Luke tells us that they went out preaching the kingdom of God and repentance. So let's just kind of put this in order. These guys went out and they were doing just that, preaching the good news and the bad news. By the way, did you know the good news is only as good as the bad news is bad? And the bad news is that we have sinned. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. Every single one of us are not where we need to be. Even on our greatest day, Isaiah tells you and me, our greatest day is still to the Lord. Filthy rags, it's not, you still blew it. And so the bad news is, is that we've all made mistakes and blown it. The second bad news is this, God's gonna hold us all accountable. He has to. He wouldn't be a good judge if he didn't. I've been to court a couple times, sometimes for other people, a couple times for myself. And what you're always asking for is, hey, judge, let me go, you know? Let me go. And wouldn't it be bad if a judge just looked at everyone who came in as an offender and said, you know what? I'm having a crazy day. Get out of here, you silly guy, you know? And he started forgiving everybody and all the people, all the victims laying around going, what the heck? A good judge is like, I can't do that. I have to hold you accountable. The bad news is you're a sinner. The double bad news is, is that you will be held accountable. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What do we do then? Well, you keep preaching the good news. The good news is, is that Jesus Christ took upon himself your sins and my sins, our penalties, and he suffered in your place. And he went to the judge of all the earth and he said, I'll pay for Luke Frechette. He's with me. I know he deserves to be sentenced in this way. Would you please put his sentence in full on my account? And would you take Daniel's sentence in full? And would you put it on my account? And would you take Bonnie and Jan's, would you take their full sentence and put it on my account? And that's the good news of Jesus Christ. That's the gospel. It's not just the good news, it's the bad news, understanding that we've all blown it, we've all made mistakes. This resonates so deeply with every single human. Everybody knows they've blown it. It's always freaky to me when I find somebody that's like, I'm not that bad. I'm like, compared to who, Hitler? Like what? Where's your, where's your mark? Where do you, where's your reference point here? You guys know sin is an archery term. And sin means not bullseye. That's all it means. It's not perfect. And if you ask anybody, any cognitive person at all in the whole entire world, have you been perfect your whole life? Everybody who's got any sanity at all would say, well, no, I'm not perfect. Oh, okay, well, then you're a sinner fallen from grace. You don't get to go to heaven based on your own efforts. As a matter of fact, the only people that get to go to heaven are perfect people and forgiven people. If you can just hit bullseye every single day for your whole entire life, man, you're gonna walk right in, no big deal. Nobody's doing that. And we compare each other to other people that are worse than us, don't we? Okay, sin is still sin. I always use the illustration of me and Tim Tebow having a football throwing contest. 
And if me and Tim Tebow went out in the parking lot and said, okay, Tim, we're both gonna try and hit the ocean. Okay, the ocean's that direction. I'm gonna do my best and I throw as far as I can and it goes like three parking spots away like, because <laughs> I can't throw a football very far. And then Tim Tebow gives everything he has and he throws this perfect spiral, 80 yards, but it falls short of the ocean. Obviously, Tim Tebow did way better than Luke Frechette. And I was like, man, Tim Tebow's amazing. But if you're going to judge us based on accuracy and did we actually reach the goal, neither one of us did it. Everybody, even the most pure saint in the entire world, whoever you compare yourself to or not to, has fallen short of the glory of God. These guys went out with that message, and I say that to say this. Look at verse 13. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. Stop right there, eyes up here. I need to remind you at this point, these are ordinary men doing extraordinary things. These are doofuses. These are the ones in Acts chapter 4, 13 would be sitting in front of the Sanhedrin and they would look at them and say, hey, it appears to us that you guys are idiotos in the Greek. <laughs> Idiots. Read Acts 4, 13. It says that you guys are uneducated and untrained men. It's the word idiotos. <laughs> but they perceived that they'd been with Jesus. These are ordinary men doing extraordinary things. Sometimes we love to be around extraordinary men and women, like, oh, that person's super gifted. They've got a lot, of, they're doing things. And that's not an inaccurate observation. But sometimes then we put ourselves on the, on the pew or the back row. I don't have those gifts. Follow the order here. You know what they did? They went out and they preached the kingdom and they preached repentance. They laid hands on people. They anointed them with oil. I've got some oil in my pocket right now. They anointed them with oil and they cast out devils. <laughs> Ordinary people doing extraordinary things. I've heard people, myself included, ask this question from time to time. I don't see anything happening. I don't see any miracles. I don't see any power. And I would just ask the question, are you going out? Are you laying hands? Are you actually teaching the gospel and repentance? Are you discipling people in this way? Is this what you live for? Is this what you're doing with your spouse and with your kids? And I'm not saying this in a bullying way or a belligerent way, because it's kind of difficult to do that. Sometimes you can actually become a little bit domineering and we back off, well, I don't wanna offend anybody. No, 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 everybody's already offended, it's okay. It's okay to be offensive. We're gonna see that in just a few chapters here. Let me just say this. I wanna be guilty one day of going out, doing what Jesus asked me to do, and having on my lips the kingdom of God, the good news, and also this need to repent. To repent, by the way, literally means to think differently, therefore you act differently. To think differently about sin, to think differently about God's word, to think differently about God. To repent means to rethink, and how you think is how you behave. And when you re, oh, Lord, I, had, I went for a ride, I went for a, sp I, oh, Lord, I repent. I repent, boom, good job. Don't make excuses. Don't put boundaries and reasons, justifications for your sin. Well, I was dropped on my head as a kid. That's what I do now, I do these things, you know. It's like, no, God's word, repent. And when you do that, I believe it's gonna be followed and accompanied by power. I'll just say it this simply. They went out and did what God asked them to do because it was a command, okay? God's commandments are his enablements. Where's the power at in your life? God says to do something, do it. I'm gonna lay hands on my, on, and pray for this person. I'm gonna preach repent. I don't feel comfortable doing that. I don't feel like I have the authority to do that. I don't have the knowledge. Okay, you probably don't. Just do it anyways because he said to. And oftentimes, power accompanies, I should say it differently. Every time, power accompanies obedience, if, and I'm gonna say, I'm gonna end because I gotta keep going. If you don't have these things flowing in your life, people being healed, people repenting, power, okay, it could be because there's an area of your life where there's a lack of obedience. God's asked you to do something, well, I'll get around to it. That's not really a big deal. Power accompanies obedience. And may God give you clarity in what he wants you to do or not do. By the way, if you take the time, there's now a story inserted right after this verse, but then in verse 30, it connects. The story kind of just is standalone for, for, for a reason we'll see in a minute, but verse 30 connects to verse 13. I'm just gonna read it to you. It says, then the apostles gathered to Jesus and told him all the things, both what they had done and what they had taught. Stop right there, eyes up here. There's a story, we'll read it, but in verse 30, it says that once they got sent out and did what they were to do, they came right back and they told Jesus all the things that they'd done. They reported it to him. Taking a deep breath before I say this, so I don't pass out for one. Did you know there'll be a day where you sit before Jesus Christ and report everything that you did and said for his kingdom? <laughs> That's crazy. Like, pinch yourself. Like, guys, I love you guys. I see you all. This is amazing. We're having so much fun. Life's crazy. There'll be a day, though, where you and Jesus sit face to face and say, dude, what, how was it? What'd you do? What'd you do? I gave you the word. I, I gave, what'd you do? And I pray in Jesus' name that your story, your time with Jesus is robust. 
is powerful. It is, is incredible. And Jesus brings his buddies, oh, come here, this is crazy. Tell that story again, John. Let's hear that story. That was crazy. You tell that story. I was nuts. Hey, how you did that, how you endured in this world, how you lived and you persevered. There'll be a day of reckoning. The Bible calls it the Bema seat judgment seat, where God blesses us and says, good job. I can't believe you did that. Man, you just loved your spouse, loved your kids. You, shot, you abstained from the world. Good job. And I say that to be an encouragement to you and to me. I need to be encouraged. Okay, the devil wants to take us all out. The devil wants to get us to slow down, believe the lies in our head. These guys went out, did what they were supposed to do, and I guarantee you they were just as surprised as the next guy. Did you see when we prayed for that person, they got healed? I can't believe that happened. And we preached to that one person. We said, hey, you got to repent of your sins. And they cried and repented and became a believer. They go back to Jesus and they report all the things that they'd done. Guys, simultaneously, in this mission trip, bad things are happening, though. Simultaneously, right in the world we live in, churches are growing, youth camps are happening, I'm going on vacation in a couple hours. Bad things are happening. Look what happens next. Look at verse 14. It says, now King Herod heard of him, for his name had become well known. And then he said, oh, John the Baptist is risen from the dead. Therefore, these powers are at work in him. That was King Herod's response to who Jesus was. Look at verse 15. Others said, man, it's Elijah. Elijah's here. That's what's going on. And then others said, no, 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 no. It's the prophet or one of the prophets. Stop right there. Eyes up here. A bunch going on right now. Number one, it says in verse 14, now King Herod heard of him. Stop right there. Eyes up here. I love this part. Jesus sends his disciples out. And whose name comes to Herod's ear? Jesus. Not Philip, not Peter, not Andrew, not James, not Bartholomew. His disciples go out and all of a sudden Herod hears about Jesus Christ. The reason this makes me so happy is because we're all been commissioned to go out, not in our name, but in his name. We've all been commissioned to go out. My shirt, you can't see it, it says King Jesus on it. It's kind of a small font. King Jesus. Cut the beard. Is that how you can see it? Okay. It's a good idea. We'll pray about it. <laughs> The idea in our lives is can you, can I, can we, like it says in Matthew 5, 16, let your light so shine before men that they see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Can you reflect, can you deflect all that God's given to you to the glory of God and the good of others? This is the challenge. Pastor Rob Verdine uh, asks us as ministry leaders all the time. He says, can God trust you with his glory? Is his glory safe with you? If God begins to bless you, bless your marriage, bless your finances, is he, do you know when you lay your head down at night or wake up early in the morning, to God be the glory? I'm just a knucklehead. I'm just a saved sinner doing my best. I'm showing up early, staying late, saying yes to everybody. I'm doing my best at business. I don't know. How are you blessed? God's grace, God's glory. This happens, by the way, in micro and macro levels where we take God's glory and make sure it deflects upwards. The micro level is in every little small conversation, every little thing you do when you wash your car or mow your lawn, you're thinking to yourself, I hope God's glorified in this. Thank you, Lord. I'm gonna do all that I do for the glory of God. First Corinthians 10, 31, micro levels. And if you're walking in micro glories where everything you're doing, you're just humbled and grateful and blessed and, and useful, it's awesome. Then in the macro glories, when God does something bigger, your reaction is gonna be, oh yeah, God's glory as opposed to taking some for yourself. I was watching uh, Loa, Ni Loa Niles, Noah Lyles. You guys know Noah Lyles, the fastest man on earth right now. He's one of the runners for the USA track team. And, and I don't know Noah Lyles, but when he was being interviewed, one of the interviewers said, hey, you're at the Olympics. What does the Olympics mean to you? And, and out of his mouth, he said this. He said, I think the Olympics for me means I have an opportunity to show the world that I am indeed the greatest runner there is. And you know what? He probably is the greatest runner there is. He's probably the greatest runner. But for him to say it, the Bible actually says in the book of Proverbs, don't, let, don't, don't speak your own greatness. Let other people speak your greatness. And I don't know him, and he's got to be a competitor. Something in my soul, though, winced when he's like, I just want everyone to know I'm the greatest. I was like, ah, you know, I hope you win. Get the gold, you know, but then humble yourself. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Man, it's crazy. These guys were sent out, though, with power. How tempting would it have been to take a little bit of the glory themselves? And it says right here that Jesus' fame reached Herod's ears. Again, for people like me and people like us who are part of something right now, may we continually to humble ourselves. It's a safe road. Humble yourself in the micro conversations. Every single day, get on your knees, 
Look around at the provision God's given to you and say, thank you, Jesus. I deserve not. And then in the macro glories, when something, anyway, give God the glory. Well, it says here that King Herod heard of him for his name had become well known. But then he started getting weird. He said, oh, John the Baptist is risen from the dead. Therefore, these powers are at work in him. Others said it's Elijah. Others said it's the prophet, one of the prophets. The the reason Elijah and the other prophets was a consideration of who Jesus was is because in the book of Malachi, it says that Elijah would actually come before the Messiah and he would turn the hearts of fathers toward their sons and sons toward their fathers that they might repent lest they be cursed. Remember, it's the very last promise and prophecy. So everyone's like, oh, this is Elijah, promise. That's, or in Deuteronomy 18, when Moses said, hey, there's a prophet coming after me, make sure and listen to him. If you don't, you're going to be cursed. And so they're thinking, oh, it must be one of the prophets, Jesus, or it's Elijah. But here Herod says, oh, oh no, it's John the Baptist. He was all messed up, and we're going to see why. When he saw Jesus, he reacted in this way. They're all wrong, by the way. Elijah, one of the prophets. It was the prophet that Moses talked about, or John the baptizer. I say that to say this. I mentioned this a couple weeks ago. Everybody you talk to, anybody you talk to, will have some understanding of who Jesus Christ is. They might even have an opinion or an idea or commentary on who Jesus Christ is. Here's the good news. Who Jesus Christ is the truth of God's word, the way that he wrote the world, all those things, it doesn't matter what your opinion or my idea or someone else's commentary is, the truth doesn't change for anybody. Everybody has some idea about Jesus. Oh, he's a great teacher. Yeah, keep going. Anything else? Oh, he's probably a prophet for sure, for sure. What, anything else? Is he the son of God? Well, I wouldn't go that far. (laughs) And everybody has an idea about Jesus. And I would just say, I don't need to stress about it or fret about it because it doesn't change. It's not a popular opinion. It's not a vote, not a sliding scale. These guys were all wrong. Jesus' fame is growing, and they're all messed up. The most messed up, though, was Herod. When he heard about Jesus, he spazzed out. He panicked. He freaked out. He heard about Jesus. What's Jesus doing? Healing people, gathering crowds, delivering folks, and he starts to panic. Why? I'll tell you why. You'll see it in a minute. Because Herod had a guilty conscience. Herod was on the outside looking at. Herod was living a lifestyle reprobate and godless. He's called King Herod here, but he's not really a king. The children of Israel didn't have a king at this time. They had some people politically named that. They were under the rule of Rome at this time. Rome was their king. But Herod wanted this to be his name. I can't go into details. It's not even worth it, to be honest. But the Herod clan, the Herods, the Herods are horrible. Just imagine the worst Jerry Springer episode you ever saw. And multiply it. Get Maury Povich on there and Phil Donahue. Get them all, man. It's bad news bears. You guys remember Phil Donahue? I just dated myself right there. Anyways. (laughs) Herod the Great was the one who killed the little babies. He died right after Jesus was born. He tried to kill the little babies in Bethlehem there. Thousands of people died. Herod the Great had three sons. This is one of them. He had a couple more sons. All of them were bad, every single one of them. As a matter of fact, this guy's dad would be seen in Acts chapter 12, Herod Agrippa. This is King Herod. Herod Agrippa would come in Acts chapter 12, and he would be eaten alive by worms and pass out dead after killing uh, James, the, the brother of John, by pushing him off the pinnacle of the temple. And then later on in Acts chapter 22, you see Herod Agrippa the second. Herod Agrippa II, Paul gave his defense to. You got Herod Agrippa I, Herod Agrippa II, Herod Agrippa Antipas, great, Herod the Great. And I just want you guys to listen to Herod Agrippa and all these things so that way you guys can possibly get a grip of it. Uh, I should have even done that. Anyways, Herod Antipas, not Antipasta, Antipas. That's this guy right here. He is living in sin and he hasn't repented of it. And so when he hears about Jesus, he spazzes out and says, it's John the Baptist. He's come back from the dead. He's panicking because he has a guilty conscience. Let's just study that. I want you guys to see the story here. Look at verse 16. It says, but when Herod heard, when Herod heard, he said, this is John whom I beheaded. He's been raised from the dead. For Herod himself had sent and laid hold of John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother, Philip's wife. For he had married her. Stop right there. Eyes up here. This story gets real dark, real quick, real fast. But we find out that Herod thinks this is John the baptizer come back from the dead. I've beheaded him and now he's alive. It's interesting how Jesus and the message of God's grace has two different impacts on people. 
Some people hear the grace and goodness and the good news of Jesus Christ and they go running towards him, sinner saved by grace, I need repentance. Other people spaz out and run the opposite way and start concluding silly things. Have you seen how polarized our world is and how sinful and crazy our world is? And I'll tell you what, we all know that we find ourselves falling short of the glory of God, but the difference is in how we then respond to the sin in our own hearts, how we respond. Herod here has an opportunity hearing about Jesus. Man, you know what I need the most? Jesus. I need to be forgiven of my sins. But instead, he goes back into his hiding place in order to keep everyone around him happy. And the story is told here. I'm not sure how many of you guys uh, watch the Olympics when it's on uh, every four years or two years or something. I like the Olympics. I enjoy the, the camaraderie and the sporting ship and all that stuff. But I don't know. Maybe you guys watched the opening ceremonies as well. We were about an hour into the air opening ceremonies and our internet went out. I think God's grace saved us from, from what was going on. And I'm not here to pick a fight or go down that road. But as you guys know or maybe you've read the headlines, there were some things in the opening ceremonies that had nothing to do with the Olympics whatsoever. It was absolutely godless. It was anti-Christ. Anti-Christ means not just against Christ, but in the place of Christ. It was bad. And when the people were interviewed, when people were asked about how they put it together, there was no apology made for the things that were put into the design of the opening ceremony. I believe it was even put together by people who don't know what the Olympics stand for. And I'm just as confused and I've got questions and yet I see stories like this where we find our story unfolding where King Herod has killed John the baptizer and instead of repenting of his sins, he just validates them and continues to move forward. And what we should do when we're busted is find ourselves repenting and saying, Lord, would you cleanse me? Would you be merciful to me? And I don't wanna get political and all these other things, but it's pretty, pretty crazy what happened. Look at verse uh, 17. I think I read it to you. It said, for Herod himself had sent and laid hold of John, the baptizer, and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. Stop right there, eyes up here. We just went straight soap opera. I don't know if you guys were able to catch that. Uh, Herod arrests John for his wife's sake, but he didn't say his wife. It said his brother's wife's sake, who he had married. Herod, Antipas here, took his, wife, his brother's wife from him as her own. In order to do that, he, I don't need to go into the history, but he had to take his own wife that was a princess from the Medo-Persian area, and he had to push her aside, which started a war between him and her dad. So now he has a wife that's been divorced and scorned. He has a brother that he's offended and a wife that's not even his own. Her name's Herodias, named after King Herod as well. When I typed in Herodias into my notes, the spell check said hernias. I left it. I was like, that's right. That's right. This is all messed up. And instead of making, instead of, so when he did this, he took Philip's wife as his own, got rid of his own wife. It's all jacked up. And now John the baptizer, we're going to see here, John the baptizer, look what it says, uh, verse 18, because John had said to Herod, hey, it's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Therefore Herodias held it against him and wanted to kill him. But she could not, stop right there, eyes up here. Again, we're looking at a really sad soap opera here. John the baptizer sees this happening. I don't know what relationship John the baptizer had with King Herod. John the baptizer was a famous prophet in those days as well. And I don't know how word got back to him, if it was a direct conversation. I do know this though, John the baptizer wasn't afraid to be politically incorrect. He wasn't afraid to tell the leader of the nation, the proposed leader of the nation, hey, what you're doing is not okay. That's not okay. Now, it got him in big trouble, got him arrested. We're gonna see his head gets cut off his body for standing for the truth. I think it's worth considering. Jesus said, hey, if they hate you, just know they hated me first. Sometimes I, I don't like to be hated. I don't know about you guys. I kind of like everyone to like me, even people that don't like me. I kind of wonder, why don't you like me? You know, it's a, Jesus said, it's not about you. It's about you, me in you. It's the truth of God that you stand for. And if they hated Jesus Christ, who, by the way, was God's son, the most loving person that could ever be, the perfect person, the perfect God. If they hated him, then they're definitely gonna hate me for sure. I'm not even close to Jesus. I blow it all the time. Jesus was nothing but love. But John the baptizer goes on record and says to Herod, to his face, and to Herodias, this isn't okay. This is a tough position. We've all had friends in our lives and family members in our lives that are doing things that they shouldn't do, walking outside of God's grace, doing things that they ought not to do. And it's a hard line to toe because none of us want to be judgmental. None of us want to be you know, convicting in that way. But I'll tell you what, 
I think we've all drifted to the side of, I don't want to upset the apple cart. I don't want to be politically incorrect. As a matter of fact, at the opening ceremonies, some of the things that were done were so gross and, and so anti-Christ, which, by the way, would have never been done. You would have never seen in the opening ceremonies of the Olympics anybody making fun of Islam. They would have never done it. You, they would have never trampled on the, the Quran. They would have never done it. But they would do it against Jesus Christ. It's the Last Supper. And we watch, wonder what the heck's going on. Elon Musk was at the opening ceremonies. And Elon Musk, I don't know. I think he was, maybe he was raised Catholic. I don't know. I've tried to find out his faith, where he stands. I don't know. But he was offended. And he said, that was not okay, what they did to the Christians. Then he went on to make commentary. And he said, you know what? Christians, this is his own opinion. I don't know what he meant by this. I didn't have a chance to ask him. He hasn't called me back. <clears throat> I'm just kidding. Yeah, maybe when, he went on to say, Christianity, quote, Christianity has lost its teeth. That's what he said. He looked at this and he said, this, you know, in Elon Musk, he has more teeth than the rest of us. He, he'll fight anybody. But his opinion was, man, they should, they, you guys shouldn't stand for this. I'm not asking that we go fight. I don't think our fight is horizontal. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. We wrestle against principalities. Jesus prophesied, we can see it's gonna get worse before it gets better. I struggle with praying for the people on that opening ceremony that were offensive to me, praying for, the, for their souls. I, I struggle with that, but the Bible tells us to to pray for them that they'd repent, they'd be convicted. When John the baptizer went to Herod and Herodias and said, guys, this ought not to be done. I prom that was the truth, but I promise you it was also done in love. The reason I say that is because Herod was wrecked. He didn't know what to do. Herodias, hernias, Her Herodias made him arrest, hey, arrest John. Herodias talking trash about our union, talking trash about our lifestyle. I want you to arrest him. And he's in this kind of Ahab-Jezebel relationship where he's the king, but she's really the tail's wagging the dog and all this stuff's going on and he has to arrest John the baptizer. This is the story. As I mentioned, this is recorded in Luke and in Matthew and in Mark. Mark gives us the most details. So I'm just gonna read it. We're gonna see how this story unfolds. Verse 19. Therefore Herodias, this woman, she held it against John and she wanted to kill him, but she could not. Why? Verse 20, for Herod feared John knowing that he was a just and holy man and he protected him. And when he heard him, he did many things and he heard him gladly. Stop right there, eyes up here. This is all messed up. I'm gonna say it, but I don't really mean it, but poor Herod. I mean, he deserves this, he earned it, he got in this situation, but poor Herod, John the baptizer now is living in his kingdom. He's in prison. Herodias says, can you just kill this guy? He's like, ah, I'd rather not kill him. He's a prophet, he's been used powerfully. Like, this is crazy, you're only offended because he's plowing down your row, telling you your sin is the one that needs to be dealt with and repented of. And as a matter of fact, and Herod didn't say this to her, but we see it in the text, Herod hangs out with John almost every day. He says, hey, John, let's talk. And when John talks, something in Herod's spirit, something that is nowhere new to this guy's got it. Isn't that radical? Have confidence in the truth, in love. You don't need to salt it up and season it up and spice it up. Just tell the people the truth in authority, in humility, in confidence. And your reasoning, your mental capacity that God created will come alive. And hear Herod every time. Can you imagine Herod? This guy's out of control. But every time he hung out with John the baptizer, he's like, dude, I feel like you're reading my mail, looking into my soul and telling me the truth. Can we meet again later? Herodias didn't have such a soft heart towards John. She was convicted in her sin. I love what it says here that she wanted to kill him. And I just need to say that. We'll see it in the text here. That's the nature of sin. Sin always wants to kill you. It doesn't just want to slow you down. It doesn't want to just, you know, hang out a little bit and come back later. Sin, the wages of sin is death. The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And that's the nature of the enemy of our souls, of our hearts. We need to remind ourselves of that next time we're tempted to dabble, next time we're tempted to compromise, next time we're tempted to do something silly. Well, she wouldn't and couldn't kill him because Herod feared him. Look at verse 21, ugh. Then an opportune day came when Herod on his birthday gave a feast for his nobles and the high officers and the chief men of Galilee. All the power brokers are there hanging out together. And he's gonna have a birthday. 
We all love birthdays. My son's birthday is tomorrow. We love partying and celebrating the birth of one another. When you get older, you try and forget your birthday. You're like, I don't think it's my birthday. It can't be my birthday, you know. And not enough candles at Walmart to you know, celebrate my birthday. A- anyways, it's his birthday, and so he's celebrating. I have it circled in my Bible, though. It says, when an opportune time came, an opportune day. And I just need to spend a little bit of time exploring the text. Herodias wanted John dead but wasn't able to do it for righteousness sake. But Herodias was patient. Sin is patient, the devil is patient. And in an opportune time, the devil in his patience is setting up a trap for me, setting up a trap for you, and he will wait for you until that day. For this day, it was a day, it was a birthday, let's have a party. And the party they have is, by the way, illicit. This would have been a normal, they love to party in in Jerusalem and and in Israel, they love to celebrate families and stuff like this. This party would have heavy drinking and it would have illicit dancing, all kinds of things that actually would not have happened even in in this first century kind of wacky world, they would have never done that, but they did it. Because Herodias knew, I'm gonna take this guy down. I gotta set my husband up for failure so that way I can kill John. I say that to say this, be on guard for those opportune days, those opportune times that the enemy's gonna get you. It might be just you're tired. Man, I'm so tired, I've been going hard, and you start to take your armor off and let your guard down. Maybe it's not just physical exhaustion, maybe it's emotional and relational exhaustion. Things are just hard with the people you work with or live with, or maybe there's other things. Maybe it's suffering, there's pain going on, or maybe there's stressors and pressures. I can't believe how much money we don't have, and all of these things. I don't know what it is for you or for me, but when we find ourselves vulnerable, which by the way, none of those things are sins in and of themselves. It's not a sin to be exhausted. It's not a sin to be overwhelmed and even stressed out. And don't stress, but it's, you know, pressures. That's not a sin. But sin is lurking at the door in our moments of weakness. You've got to have an action plan. You've got to know what to do when you find yourselves vulnerable in that position. How vulnerable can I get before I become super vulnerable? Here, we find Herod throwing a party. It's a good day. It's a fun day. And it says he invites all his homies to do it, but Herodias has evil intentions. So too, the enemy of your soul, the enemy of my soul has evil intentions on you. Do not believe the lies. He is looking for an opportune time for you as well. Look at verse 22. And when Herodias, his daughter, herself came in and danced and pleased Herod and those who sat with him, the king said to the girl, ask me whatever. I'm going to say it the way he probably did. Ask me whatever. Oh, you know. Verse 23, he also swore to her, <laughs> up to half my kingdom. It says it in two verses here, it's repeated twice, because in the Greek, it's actually indicated that he just kept saying it over and over. You ever been around a drunk person that's trying to talk? We all seen it. I've, I've probably done it. I know I've done it. I, I, mean, I repent. We've all seen it though, and it's like, oh wow, they're trying to talk. That's not really working very well. And what happens when you've been drinking, you try and talk and you actually repeat yourself over and over and you get all kind of boasty and stuff. And, and so here, King Herod is drunk, but he's also been enticed because his wife's, his wife's an evil person. She had tempted him with her 14-year-old daughter, Salome. And she had this whole thing concocted. She said, okay, we're gonna get him drunk on his birthday. Salome, I want you to, to really, I know how to, how to do this. So here's what you, she trained her in this. Go out there and dance in this way. And we're gonna get him off his rocker, get him off his guard. And we're gonna get him to promise what? anything you want, and then come ask me what you want. And I could go into this, we don't have time, I gotta keep going, but just it's just so sad. And yet I feel even in my own life, the Lord would say, Luke, take this seriously. Consider what's going on here. The devil is patient. What's going on? There's some drinking, there's some partying, guards are going down, morals are waning, Partying's happening, illicit dance, all these things. Be very careful in environments like this. I wouldn't, there's no reason for Christians to even be in environments like this because bad things are going to happen. I have a whole teaching planned here for alcohol and consumption. All I would say is this, the Bible does not forbid alcohol consumption unless you're underage and breaking the law, unless you're causing other people to stumble, unless you're getting drunk, and unless you're addicted. Those four things will say, not for you. No alcohol. There are more verses in the Bible that warn against alcohol than there are verses that allow for alcohol consumption. The Bible does not forbid alcohol consumption, but it gives warnings, parameters, and guardrails. The best bet, the safest bet, is to take those guardrails and guidances very seriously. Don't get drunk. Don't cause other people to stumble. Don't be addicted to anything. 
Go in long seasons of abstinence if you can. Just say, I don't want, I'm not gonna be given over to this thing. I'm not gonna let it take me astray. The Bible tells us warnings after warnings after warnings. Be careful when you put that alcohol in, those types of spirits in, it leads to dissipation. Galatians chapter five tells us. We see it right here. It's a whole case study. He gets drunk, starts saying crazy stuff, boasting. By the way, he didn't even have the capacity to give up to half his kingdom. He didn't even have a kingdom. Rome rules. Had the Roman people heard him say that, they would have said, what are you talking about? He's like, I'm drunk. I'm just saying stuff, you know? If you've heard, I got more stuff to say. I better not. Come back to the 12, the extended version. Don't do it. Verse 24. And so she went out. She said to her mother, what shall I ask? And She said, the head of John the Baptist. And immediately she came in with haste to the king and, said, and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. Oh, and the king was exceedingly sorry. Yet because of the oaths and because of those who sat with him, he did not want to refuse her. He didn't want to look like an idiot. Now he made a promise. He has to keep his promise. He should have ever said that. But now instead of offending them, he's going to offend John the baptizer. He's really caught in a troubling situation. Immediately the king set an executioner and commanded his head to be brought, and he beheaded him in prison, brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl, and the girl gave it to her mother. When the disciples heard of it, they came and they took away the corpse, his corpse, and laid it in a tomb. I'm going to have the worship team come up and lead us in a song because we have to get to that point in the service, but let me make some comments. This is crazy. Can you imagine? This is the biggest buzzkill of a birthday party ever. I mean, it doesn't get any bigger than this. And I'll say it again. Poor Herod got himself here. Poor Herod's like, oh my, can you imagine having fun, drinking, dancing, all this, all fun, and yet the wages of sin is death. We find ourselves seeing John the baptizer die. Herod and Herodias would eventually, after many, many years after this, be put in exile, and they'd both kill themselves. That's how their lives would end poorly. This is not the way you want to live your life. This is not the things we want to find ourselves doing. Look at this next verse, though. Look at verse 30. Then the apostles gathered to Jesus, and they told him all the things, both of what they had done and what they had taught. And he said to them, come aside by yourselves to a deserted place and rest a while. Stop right there, eyes up here as the band begins to play. That this all just happened in the middle of it. Mark gives us the biggest, longest story the disciples are sent out, they go out, they do these things, and while they're doing these things, meanwhile, the Olympic ceremony is happening. Meanwhile, there's debauchery and craziness happening in the world all around us. It's just happening. And yet the gospel's still going out. And when they get back to Jesus, they tell him, they open up their hearts, they say, dude, this is crazy, and Jesus looks at him with a big smile on his face. And yet at the exact same time, he finds out that his cousin John is dead. It's a heavy deal. I wish I had more time to develop it just to sit in it. And what Jesus does on the heels of this news, he says, guys, let's go, let's go take a break. You need a vacation. Jesus loves vacations. I planned it perfectly. But the world that we live in is not the world that we're gonna be in forever. This isn't the world we live in. I've seen some people get really irate about the Olympics and boycott it and all these things, and I'm not gonna judge that action either. I understand the heart. We, we live in this world. We're to be salt and light. I don't want to be tipped over by the way the world's doing things in such a way where I can't continue to love. I also don't want to be lured into the things of the world. I don't want to be led astray. I don't cast judgment towards Herod here. I learn from his mistakes. Okay. Herod got taken out. Herod didn't have his mind right. Herod was living sensually. And the wages of sin is death. You've all experienced this. You might not have died physically like John the Baptizer has died, but every time you and I sin, every time we gamble, every time we compromise, something in our soul dies, something in our relationship dies, something in our virtue dies. Just like John, where there's a, there's a haunting. John the Baptist is back from the dead. It's gotta be him, huh? Can you imagine Herod's conscience just absolutely wrecked? I'm gonna have you guys stand up. We're gonna turn the lights low. I want you to remind yourself right now, though, of the good news of Jesus Christ. I have things that haunt me as well. Things that I didn't do right. And yet Jesus Christ has paid for my sins. He's paid for your sins as well. And Jesus would say to you this day, hey, you can be forgiven. You can be restored. 
you can be renewed. Why don't you come away with me and rest a while? Why don't we hang out and talk? The world is dirty. The world is murky. The world is painful. Lord, in Jesus' name, now as we sing this song to you, maybe somebody needs prayer. Maybe somebody needs to come kneel at the altar and repent. Maybe somebody needs hands laid on them in oil. I don't know, Lord, but in Jesus' name, would you move about us this morning and have your way? Lord, I'll be the first to say, I repent, Lord, in Jesus' name. Maybe just say that under your lips. If there's something in your life, anything in your life at all, just take advantage of that. Say, Lord, I repent in Jesus' name. Have mercy on me and help me to be the man or the woman of God you want me to be. And Lord, we trust you. Thank you for your great grace, your great mercy. And I pray an anointing on us too as we sing right now, Lord, that we would be those who are inspired to go out and do it to teach and preach the kingdom to ourselves first, to repent first, to lay hands on ourselves first, and to see, Lord, the devil cast out of our lives first, and to see the power of God and the fame of God grow in Lincoln County. Jesus, we love you. Receive our praises now, Lord, as we sing to you in Jesus' name. Amen. If you need prayer, come on and get some. Let's worship the Lord. Come to the altar if you need to repent and say, I want to go all in, Lord.